I want to thank the viewers for joining us today. My name is Param Eftakari, a co-founder and a senior fellow at the Institute for Critical Infrastructure Technology. I'm joined by Stan Wisselman, an ICIT fellow and a security strategist for HP. Stan, it's great to have you. Good to be here. Fantastic. So as you know, we're here to talk about um, cybersecurity issues, next generation strategies and technologies that our uh, viewers can um, implement to um, improve the security posture of their organizations. Now, you were a former CISO at Fannie Mae, you've been at the NSA, now you're a security strategist for one of the leading security organizations in, in the world. You have a very unique perspective on the challenges um, facing organizations, their hurdles, and obviously the threat landscape. So my first question is, you know, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing organizations and critical infrastructure sectors when it comes to securing their data and networks? Well, one thing we've seen is the cyber criminal has actually specialized in this ecosystem. Mm. So that enables them to um, really hone their craft. And they've done that over the years. Yeah. Um, we've also seen a number of nation states um, enter into this market, as it were, and go after a number of targets. And so I think, you know, we've moved from over the decades from hacktivists or folks that are just playing around to very capable um, attackers and threat actors. Uh, the challenge um, is that we haven't necessarily hardened our systems and our applications to make it any dip more difficult for these <laughs> folks. As we saw at OPM, and we've written briefs about that yep. here at ICIT, um, we didn't necessarily make it difficult for them to actually get in and, yeah. and get the, the data out of those systems that OPM was managing. Um, and so the, the, as far as the threat landscape and what the threat actors are after, it is the sensitive data. But I think the other thing we've been seeing is more destructive kind of attacks, whether it be Saudi Aramco, what we saw at Sony Pictures, and what a lot of folks are experiencing with the ransomware. Yeah. You know, so I think it's really um, the destructive side of things is scaring folks as far as the potential impact of being able to continue to operate their business or yeah. their agency. Um, and that's also forcing some changes as far as how we actually can build in resilience. We need to be able to prepare for those kind of destructive attacks and yeah. be able to continue to operate in that kind of environment. Absolutely. So given um, the diversity of uh, HP's portfolio, what are some uh, technologies or even you know, uh, process changes or strategies that um, your organization is recommending to, um, uh, to companies and sectors as a whole to kind of beef up their posture? Sure, so if you think about security intelligence and, and break it into two pieces, one piece being really the, the threat intelligence and the collaboration and the other being able to detect these bad actors more rapidly. So on the threat intelligence sharing, I'm, I'm a real big advocate that that's something we need to do. We need to collaborate amongst ourselves those that you trust yeah. and cre the, create these trusted collaboration circles uh, to be able to share information about what we're seeing about the tactics of these threat actors, just like they're collaborating. Yeah. They're collaborating in their yeah. ecosystem. We need to do the same thing. And so I know there's a controversy uh, about privacy and the sharing of threat intel data from the private sector with, in, uh, with the government. Yeah. And that needs to be sorted out. But independent of that, I still think we can come up with methods in which we can share among trusted peers. Now on the detection side of things, we need to do a much better job of actually detecting these bad guy actors more quickly. It's taken still 240 odd days on average Jeez. to detect these bad actors. And, and so um, some of the things we're doing, and in addition to our, our SIM technology and evolving that, we're doing a lot more with analytics. And so looking at user behavior analytics, okay. looking at analytics as far as the detecting on the network, you know, some of the, the callbacks that are going from malware, more quickly identifying infected in, you know, platforms or assets. And so that enables us to you know, hopefully reduce the dwell time, reduce the amount of time that the, the bad actor is in your environment so you can take action. Yeah. So a combination of understanding the threat landscape, understand what the threat actors are doing, also being able to then detect more quickly and then take action on yeah, that. Yeah, detect and respond. We, we've spoken a lot about this at, at our fellow meetings on, on the Hill, where the, the inevitability of being breached is there. So we need to get organizations to think about how do you create these um, um, tar pit-like environments like right, you have right. just talk about in the briefs to um, mitigate the, um, the risk from, from the point of view of um, 
creating an environment where they can't really take the data out quickly and we have time to stop them before it becomes a full-fledged breach like OPM or Sony or something. Exactly. Forth. So, I mean, again, you, you brought the point about protecting the data. We, we can no longer assume that there's this hard, crunchy exterior. Yeah. We, we really do need to assume that they will get access to what they, they're after. And yep. so if they can get access to it and you don't enable it by making it in the clear, being having it in the clear at data at rest, um, that makes it a little more difficult for them. Yeah. So we, we certainly need to be thinking about encrypting our data. Yeah, it's the reality. It's the reality we live in. So St Stan, you recently spoke at a congressional briefing on connected worlds and, and car hacking. One of our fellows, IO Active, was there. Right. They did obviously the really famous and infamous now uh, Jeep hack. Very cool. Very cool, yeah. It was a great, 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 uh, great presentation they gave. Talk a bit about uh, the Internet of Things and how this is um, expanding the attack surface that organizations and network administrators need to protect and ultimately what can they do to mitigate the risks in this new environment because uh, it's not slowing down 50 billion internet enabled devices by the end of what is it uh, uh, in about five years now so you know how can we get ahead of this uh, yet, another, yet again another thing that we need to get ahead of well I certainly think the security or the insecurity of the internet of things device enabled devices is going to be in the headlines for a while yeah I agree um, we also have been doing some research in this area and we have found that the lack of authentication and authorization is prevalent hmm. and the other concerning thing is the insecure interface with mobile and cloud, um, yeah. which again is typically what they're doing. They're communicating through some kind of mobile network or some communicating back to a cloud um, yeah. computing interface. Uh, and, and so that's, that's a challenge. And I think that even though we are seeing some additional use of encryption for uh, transport of data yeah. um, with SSL and uh, TLS, many times the way in which they're implementing it still leaves the data insecure because they mm. haven't implemented it properly or is misconfigured. <laughs> yeah. uh, so some of the things that you can do to possibly enhance this, first off, when you're acquiring any kind of IoT device, you need to be looking for the security features and assurances that are associated with sure. it. Ask about it. Yeah. <laughs> Demand it. Yeah. That, that is one of the, the, the challenges in general. We need to be asking more of yeah. our providers That's right. to ensure they're building in the security features. But you know, when you look at the default settings, it's like, don't use the default account password. Yeah. Change your password. Yeah. Um, look and see at, you know, what other security features are available. There may be some available that aren't enabled by default. You know, two-factor authentication is a great one. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, if, if you can ensure that you are um, not opening yourself up by, um, you know, having this IoT device on the same network as your other components, mm -hmm. you know, basically you need to have some kind of segmentation. Yeah. You know, so like if you think about the cars, when we were talking about that, many times they have the same communication backplane for all the communication yeah. occurring between the components. So it'd be good to actually have some of the information system that you're going to possibly be downloading these mobile applications onto on a separate, separate. network than all this, you know, more sensitive control systems right. in your car. And we see this, you know, we hear about this happening in the um, in big airplanes, you know, the entertainment systems, and right. they've been scenarios where they've hacked into the, uh, the the pilot's dashboard from the from the entertainment system. It's scary and, and stuff. It's like segment. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, Stan, we're nearing the end of the year. Um, people are looking towards the future. They're allocating budgets, making uh, 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 plans in terms of their cyber right. strategies. What can you tell our viewer, um, and from a perspective of what should their priorities be? and possibly some technologies they should be looking at uh, um, uh, as part of their 2016 strategy? I have a list. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, first off, invest in people, process, and technology, yeah. not just technology. Yeah. Um, I think the other aspect of this is when you're looking at your priorities for the next year, make sure your security objectives are aligning with your business objectives. You want to be in sync. Yeah. Um, you want to, you know, again, addressing the, the, the threat and, and, and getting intelligence information, you know, get some kind of collaboration going so uh, you can consume as well as produce threat intelligence information with your trusted peer groups. Yeah. Um, build in security to your systems and applications. And unfortunately, you have to assume that you've been breached yep. or that you will be breached. And so with that assumption, uh, know what your critical assets are. What's your sensitive data? What are they after? Think like a bad guy, yeah. you know? and uh, take the measures you need to to protect that data and that, those critical systems. 
Um, that means, in some cases, encrypting it, yeah. and also improve and enhance your detection capabilities. And finally, you know, I think that a lot of the um, programs out there have disaster recovery as an aspect of it, mm -hmm. and we plan for uh, disaster kind of events. Yeah. But we need to be thinking more in cyber resilience. Okay. So in addition to DR planning, think about resilience in a cyber context and do exercises anticipating some kind of cyber attacks. Yeah, well, the, the one thing you mentioned, which we're, we hear a lot um, when we have these discussions, is the people element of this. Um, you've been a fellow with the Institute along with some of your colleagues uh, for uh, um, nearly a year now. Um, we've really That's enjoyed, right. yeah, it's, That's it's, right. time flies when you're having fun. We're, we really enjoy kind of the expertise you bring. Obviously, HP has such a great um, resource pool when it comes to your researchers and the, the, the thought leadership you're putting out as an organization. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little about, as we close out the conversation, what is the value that um, your organization and you uh, are receiving from being a part of a think tank, being able to provide objective, nonpartisan advising to policymakers, and then building relationships with uh, decision makers in the government and in other sectors? Well, I think the, the ICIT has enabled collaboration. Yeah. You know, we've been able to communicate with folks we normally wouldn't be able to reach. And I think you've also been a force multiplier as far as um, enabling us to, uh, through your, your social media engine yeah. and your briefs and your presentations and your panels, um, enabled us to uh, get our message out and help communicate the importance of cybersecurity to a lot of key people. That's great. Well, that's what we're here for. Well, Stan, I want to thank you for joining us today. I appreciate it's good it. Good to be here. If the viewer wants to get in touch with Stan or, or anyone else from HP, you can always reach out to the Institute, and we'll, we'll be happy to connect with that. So thank you. Thanks again. All right. Thank you.